Welcome to Cool to Craft. I'm Tiffany Windsor, and I am so delighted that you are joining us for today's episode. It's all about birds and blooms. The blooms are blooming. They're magnificent, by the way. The birds are singing, and it's time to celebrate spring. On today's show, Eco Heidi has a vintage blooms and buttons necklace featuring a vintage Mama Aline technique Candace Jedrowitz works her creative magic with polymer clay, and she has thrown in a bit of recycling. Linda Peterson grabbed her collage page and a bird print to create a vintage look decoupaged clay pot. And I couldn't find one single bird in my creative stash, so my project is a butterfly in bloom art box. Are you ready? Let's celebrate spring! Eco Heidi is celebrating spring with blooms, as in bread dough flowers. It's a technique that Mama Aline made popular back in the 1960s. I'm delighted to welcome my sister, Eco Heidi Borchers. Thanks, Tiff. You know, I think this technique is one of the most classic techniques from Mama Aline. And it amazes me always on a technique like this on how timeless it is. You can take these wonderful flowers made from a slice of bread and you can just create all kinds of things. You can create all sizes. Let me show you how. So here's the ingredients that you're going to need to do this fabulous technique. And uh, you need a slice of bread, white bread. You need a tablespoon. You need a craft stick. Some toothpicks are helpful. Of course, the uh, tacky glue, some acrylic paint, and always helps to have a little bit of um, cold cream. And people have asked me before if lotion or something else would work. And I've always found that cold cream works the best. You can use a cup to mix it in, or you can use the plastic bag to mix it in. Let's move these aside. And the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna take the crust off of your bread. Move those crusts. And then you break it into smaller pieces into your cup. Also, while I'm thinking about it, day old bread does work a little bit better if you have really fresh bread, it kind of gets stuck together. Okay, it's all in our cup. Now we want to add our glue. And it's for every slice of bread, whoops, it is one tablespoon of glue. And I always, I almost always measure it. I don't like to guess it because I, if you get too much get too much glue then you're going to add a little bit more bread if you don't um, if it's too you know too dry then you're going to have to add a little bit more glue and I just put it into the cup with the bread now there are a couple ways that you can color it you can actually leave it like this, make your dough, and then paint it afterwards, or you can add the color to it. You can add the color to it now, or you can add the color to it when you have all the dough mixed. And I usually just put, depending on how intense I want my color, I usually just put several drops. Mix it around, make sure it gets all mixed. And 
and it'll start to stick to together and that's what you want before you can go in there and start using your hands to mix it around. Okay, before I take it out, I usually put some of the cold cream on my hands. That'll help it so it doesn't stick. And just like I said, you reach in there, get all that dough out, and everybody's saying, oh no, oh no. Don't worry, it comes off. The paint doesn't stick. See if I can get all those pieces out. And you just start to knead it. And don't worry when it sticks because eventually it will. It just takes a minute or so. And once you get it mixed, you want to make sure that all the paint is mixed really well. And you can see how most of it's come off of my hand. And you can kind of see how it's modeled a little bit. We want to mix it a little bit more because we want the color to be solid. Remember, this is just glue and a slice of bread. When you have it completely mixed, I want you to take it and put it into a Ziploc baggie. It needs to sit there, oh, for a few minutes, maybe five minutes, and it just needs to rest. And I'm going to clean my hands and I'll be right back. When the bread dough is done, it is very pliable. It's like a clay, and keep in mind it is a air dry clay, so you need to store it all the time in a Ziploc bag. And what you start out to do is you take little pieces, keep the main part of it in the bag sealed, and you take little pieces, and we kind of like to say the size of a garden pea. That is a good way to start. You're going to take that garden pea and you're going to squish it and make it flat. Now, this is probably one of the most important steps. The flatter you make this piece every time, the prettier and more porcelain looking that the rose will be. Okay, I have my piece flat, and then I start rolling it. Roll, and help to curve down that top edge. And there's my bud. Get another piece. Remember, it needs to be the same size. You're going to Squish it between your fingers as flat as you can. Paper thin is perfect. Put it up against the little bud. Roll it, wrap it around. Now here at this point too, don't, don't let your petal fall down below the bud because then it starts looking like a pine cone. Make sure that your petals are even across the top. And roll it down a little bit and that creates your second petal. Another one, I think we have time to put a couple more on. Flat, make it really flat. And remember, this is what creates the size of your rose. Put this one opposite. Again, don't let it fall down. It looks too much like a pine cone. Curl your petals back. And see how that's starting to look like a rose. Now, if it gets too thick right here, I usually just roll it between my fingers and just take that piece off and then I can use this to create another one. I just had to cover my dough again. <laughs> okay, we're going to squish it and we put another petal on. 
like so. And you can just stop like that if you want, or you can keep adding and adding. Isn't that cool? Now for the necklace that I made, I'm just going to quickly show you what I did. I used this really cool home decor fringe braid and I took the, the um, size that I needed, the length that I wanted, I took an end of it and stitched it together so that I would have my center point. Just give a little stitch and then I sewed all kinds of the antique buttons and in between the antique buttons, if you cut these off with a scissor when you're done, you have a flat base. In between all the antique buttons, I glued some of my bread dough roses. Isn't that pretty? So be sure you try this technique because I'm sure you're going to find all kinds of uses for it. And it's a wonderful technique to just teach all the kids and all the rest of the family. Thanks everyone. Back to you, Tiff. Candice Jedrowitz is celebrating spring with a polymer clay project. It's adorable polymer clay peepers. I'm delighted to welcome the Cool to Craft Creative Play Muse. It's Candace J. Thanks, Tiffany. Hi, everyone. Welcome to my studio. Today, I'm going to be showing you how to make a cute little nest with some hungry chicks in it. And it's all going to be made out of a water bottle crinkle paper, polymer clay, aluminum foil, glue, feathers, jewels, flowers, twigs, who knows what else. You gotta watch. Sit back and relax because here we go. This project starts with a water bottle. I'm going to cut the bottom off and I'm going to do it like Eco Heidi Borchers tells us to do it. Start it with a craft knife and then use scissors to cut it off. Okay, trim that little bit off there. And now I'm going to paint it. And I'm going to do that for two reasons. The first is when you put your crinkle paper in to make your nest, you don't want any clear showing through. Oops. So I'm using a dark brown paint and I'm just going to hold on to it and go all the way around. This by no means has to be a perfect paint job. The second reason that I paint it is that I want a nice rough surface that the glue will stick to when you go to glue on the crinkles. So here's the nest base. And we'll put that aside to dry. Here's a nest base that's already dried, and it's from a, a little bit larger water bottle, so you can use any size at all that you want. Now I'm going to start with the glue. You can put a regular base on this, like glue a felt circle on the bottom if you wanted to, but I decided to glue the crinkles all the way around. And I'm just going to squish it down in there. And then I'm going to start folding up around the edges. And just press it like that. And now I'm going to glue the inside. You want to make sure that you get the top of the nest base so you don't have any sharp edges. And then do the inside walls. And now I'm just going to start folding the crinkle paper in. And 
then I'm going to set that aside to dry. Now I have one that's already dried and once it's dried then you want to go back through back into the center and you want to pull out any loose ones or anything that doesn't look quite like you want it. And then when you get things like these you can just cut them off. But you want to leave it nice and full and it looks like I have plenty of space to put my little chicks in. Here I have everything I need to make one of these cute little chicks. I started out with a piece of aluminum foil that I molded into a little gumdroppy shape and I'm going to take a piece of polymer clay that's a mixture of all of my leftover clays from my scrap bag. So it's kind of a grayish brownish color that you would expect a baby chick to be. And I'm just folding it around the foil. You can cover up the bottom if you like, but you don't have to because it's not going to be seen. The other benefit of using an armature like this is it uses less clay and doesn't have to bake as long. There's the start of the little body. Now I've got a piece for the head, but because the little chick is reaching his neck way up to get some worms as the mom brings them in to the nest, I'm going to make him a long neck. And at the end of the neck, where it will sit on his shoulders, I'm pinching out a little flange all the way around. And, oops, got a crease on the top there. Just going to smooth it out. Working with polymer clays, or any kind of clay really, it's essential to learn how to handle the clay as though you were handling a baby chick or even a baby chick egg. Very gently. Every squish you make leaves a mark. So what I want to do to give him a little character is squish the head from side to side like that. And his mouth will go here. Now I'm going to put it on his shoulders. And I'm going to use a knitting needle that has a little bit of fluff on the end of it. There we go. This doesn't have to be perfect because it's going to be so cute. All right, so now we have a head on the body. These two pieces are going to become wings. And to do that, I'm going to make kind of a longish teardrop shape. And then I'm going to flatten it, pinch the edge, the little end into a point, and shape it out. And then I'm going to make a little knobby elbow because the baby birds have those little scrawny wings. And here you want to make the choice of forward or back, whichever way you like. And you're also going to smooth. And you can use just about anything that has a smooth edge to do this with. Another wing coming up. Flatten it. Make the point stick out. Make his little bony elbow and attach it to his shoulder. Again, I'm going to smooth it just a little bit. You might be able to tell here that there have been some glittery clays put into the scrap bag he has a little tiny bit of glitter to him. All right, now I have this little bit of yellow that's going to become a beak. And to do that, I'm going to roll a teardrop shape, flatten the end, squish it a little bit, and then make corners. Just like that. And then it's going to go on up here. 
And I'm going to give it a firm little push. Oh, he's got some brown clay on his beak. That's okay. And then I'm going to take these two tiny little balls of clay and flatten them. And they go to the sides of the beak because they're his fat little cheeks. And they can be smoothed on. Or not, if you like the look of having them just stick out. Now let's open the mouth. And I'm going to use a craft knife for that. And then I'm going to cut it about in the middle, maybe a little bit below the middle. That did not quite go the right way. That's okay. Let's redo the point. Because that's how art goes. Sometimes you have to adjust. So let's cut it open. And start to open it up a little bit like that. And then I have this little tiny piece that's going to be his tongue that I'm going to insert in there. And I'm going to use the end of the knitting needle, needle, there we go, to make his little tongue. And the last thing that goes on are his eyes. And they're little balls of black clay. And I like the way that they look kind of sticking out like that. So he has a cute little face. And here are my three chicks ready to go. Now, you'll bake them according to the directions on your clay. And when they're out and cooled, we'll finish it up. Here are my little birds, all baked and out of the oven and cooled. And I have here some down that I've trimmed off of some feathers. So I'm going to give them each just a little bit of glue on their heads. Just a dab. And on their little wingy elbows. You don't have to limit yourself to this. You can use your judgment and decide where you want to have the little fluffy down pieces. And just stick them on there. And you can pull off any extra that you have that you don't want after it's dry. Yeah, it gets kind of a comedy routine when you get the glue stuck on your hands and then it won't go on the birds. Yeah. Funny, funny. Right? Get on there. <laughs> cute. Cute, cute. All right, now we're going to place them in the nest. And to do that, I'm going to put some glue in the nest. A couple of big globs. Place the birds in. <laughs> there they are. Cutie pies. Now just take a little bit of a glossy sealer and touch the eyes. And when that's dry, it'll make the little little black eyes pop. They'll be so cute. Now, you can stop here, or you can add another dimension to it. I have a bunch of little twigs that I cut off of a, a vine that I used to have growing by my house. And it could stick down in here if you wanted. And you could add some little flowers with a dab of glue. And that would be very, very cute. Or you can leave it as is. There's those little guys. Oh, I just love them. These 
guys are so cute with their fuzzy little heads. You know, sometimes I feel guilty telling my family that I'm working hard in the studio and shouldn't be disturbed. This is just too much fun. I hope you enjoyed the project. I hope that you're inspired to try something like it, and I hope that if you do, I get to see it. You can always email me with a photo if you like, because I would love to see at Candice at CoolToCraft.com. Linda Peterson is celebrating today's theme of birds and blooms with a vintage look decoupage clay pot and it features a beautiful feathered friend. I'm delighted to welcome Linda Peterson. Hello and welcome to my little corner of the world. This is my yard located in the beautiful Ozark Mountains of Missouri and this right here, this gazebo, is my quiet place. It's a place that I can come and sit and gather my thoughts, be quiet, listen to the sounds of nature, the birds chirping. Last night I heard whippoorwills or I can listen to the frogs chirp down in the pond later on this evening. It's just a wonderful, inspiring place. I'm so glad to be a part of this show, and my project is dedicated to my grandmother, who was an avid bird lover. She collected bird figurines. She loved birds. Anytime you got a letter from her, it always had a little bird sticker on it, and I miss her so much. I'm going to be sharing a decoupaged clay pot project with you. It's perfect for your garden, especially if you have a container garden. It makes a great gift, and it's also great if you're short on time. So. Why don't we head on over to the studio, take a walk with me, and I'll show you how to do it. So let me go over a few of the supplies that you'll need for this project. First of all, you'll need some collage medium. You will also need a sanding block, and obviously mine's well used. Um, you can get these at the hardware store. I have a four inch clay pot. I also have my scissors, a sponge brush, and some black acrylic paint, and these are the basic um, materials that you're going to need. You can use any color of paint that will go with your project, but remember I'm making this kind of vintage looking, so I'm going to go with some really neutral earthy tones. Here's a couple of pieces of paper that I've chosen. I'm actually on, only going to use one of them, but this gives you an idea. You'll want to keep the background somewhat neutral, somewhat simple for this project, especially if you're going to decoupage an image over the top of it. Um, this is really nice because this is just um, some uh, dictionary print. You can also use newspaper. And then I have my collage sheet here, which you'll be able to download off of the website at cooltocraft.com. It has a couple of different sized birds on it, depending on your personal taste. And I've left a couple of them black and white. You can use them in black and white, or you can choose to color them if you want to. I also have printed or made a pattern for you. Um, for This works for the four inch clay pot. If you are using a pot of a different size, um, you might wanna take a few extra minutes to make your own pattern. And my particular pot, some of them are kind of short and squatty. This one happens to be tall. So you can also download this pattern off of the uh, Cool to Craft website. So I'm going to remove these gray sheets of paper. These were just background so you could see the paper. And obviously I've been working on some other projects. So I'm going to just work right here on my surface. Let me pull this back in. I'm going to, what we're going to do is we are going to paint the rim of our pot completely black. And we'll let that dry. Because these pots, they're so porous, um, it doesn't take long for them to dry at all. So do this first, that way you don't have to worry about getting any paint on your paper. So all the way around. And you want to make sure to get it under this lip right here. We don't, you don't have to paint the uh, entire pot completely, but you do want to make sure that you get underneath this lip. Okay, I'm going to 
And just to make it look nice, you'll want to paint down into your pot a couple inches there. The dirt will cover up the rest. And just like that, it is almost dry. You can speed it up a little bit if you've got a heat gun handy. And I do. Like I said before, this is a great project, especially if you are short on time or it makes a good housewarming gift. You can actually have several of these done pretty quickly. All right, now what we're going to do is with the pattern, you are going to cut out a piece from your decorative paper. So this we're going to decoupage onto the front of the little clay pot. If you want this all in one piece, then you'll need to make a pattern that looks like this. But you could tear strips of paper if you wanted to and um, piece it on that way. That way works too, if you didn't want to have to go to all the trouble of making a pattern. And you can use this technique for any size clay pot that you want. I put my decoupage meaning on pretty generous, again because this uh, pot is kind of porous and it It'll tend to dry out a little quicker than normal. Go around the bottom there. And then we'll stick some on the back of our paper. Yes, you could use a paintbrush, but I just have to get into my work. Make sure I got it on right. Nope. Oh. It's on upside down. There we go. All right, so you're just going to line the edge of the paper just under the brim there and set it on. It's pretty easy. You may have a couple of little um, puckers in your paper. That's okay. That, that makes, it actually, oof, makes it actually look a little better. It doesn't slide off there. And then you're going to go over the top with more decoupage medium and smooth it down. So make sure that it's all set. And like I said, it's going to have a couple little puckers in it. That's fine. It, it really won't show. In fact, it kind of looks better. It looks a little bit more aged if it does have a few puckers. But you just want to make sure that you get all of the air out of it. I think this would look pretty cool with some vintage newspaper too. And instead of trimming the bottom, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fold that over just like this. This medium dries pretty fast too. Once your paper gets good and saturated, then it bends a lot easier and you'll be able to fold those and set those edges down. Don't underestimate decoupaging. It's a great way to uh, give a lot of your projects a really quick lift, kind of bring them into a, a modern project, spruce them up a little bit. Okay. And if it gets a little dark paint on it, that doesn't matter either. Just kind of smooth that out a little bit. All right, let me dry this a little bit here. It's not completely dry. I'm using the gloss, so um, sometimes 
it uh, doesn't look like it's dry when it is dry so that's pretty good just like that so the next thing you're going to do is you're going to take and you're going to cut out your uh, bird from the the collage sheet which I've already done here and I'm going to use the bird that is already colored and if you don't want it yellow if you want it red or pink you can just go over this with some chalk or some um, distress ink and color this any color that you that you wish so I'm gonna do the same thing here I'm just gonna add a little bit of decoupage medium and then go over the top a little bit of the medium and set that down the medium that I'm using actually is a little bit of, uh, has a little bit of water resistance to it so um, you don't necessarily want to let this pot out in the uh, open air like outside but uh, it does resist water be pretty in your kitchen or on a windowsill Looking pretty good. Pretty, pretty good. Makes me think of grandma. All right, almost finished. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to come in and we're going to really age this uh, to make it look very vintage. And I'm going to dry this here real quick. And our very last step is to have fun with the sanding sponge. So just go over the top rim and sand away some of the paint. You can sand a little or a lot. And if you have the saucer with your clay pot, you're going to do the exact same thing with the saucer. I painted my saucer completely black and uh, distressed it by sanding away some of the paint here. It also helps if your paint is still a little wet. It'll take it off a little easier. This is a pretty rough grit sanding block. So we're going to come back in with our collage page right over the top. Of the black, this will give it a nice shiny um, finish and make it water resistant. We're almost done. See how quick this was. There we go. We are done. So let's take a look at what our finished project looks like. As I mentioned at the top of the show, I went into my creative studio and couldn't find one single bird. There was not one bird to be found in my creative stash. What I did find were butterflies and bugs. So what I did is I took today's theme and turned it into wings and blooms. 
let's head on out to the studio so you can see what I created. When I looked around my studio, I could not find one bird not one dang bird. So what I did is I went into my jewelry box and I found a bee and I found butterflies. So I'm kind of keeping on the theme of today's birds and blooms. Here are some of the basic supplies that I'm using for my art box. Start with just a basic box. This is a wood box that has a lid. I bought this at the craft store. You want acrylic paint to paint your box. And for the base of mine, I rubber stamped my design on. As I mentioned, this was a piece of jewelry that's a ceramic piece. And it did have a pin back on the back, so I had to really work at it to get that pin back off because I want to have a nice smooth surface to actually glue my little bumblebee down. And then I am using mosaic tiles and flat back marbles for the feet on my art box. I am adding a bloom with a stencil. This is a tulip stencil. And then you want a good glass and bead glue to glue your little mosaic tiles together for the feet. And I'm also using 3D crystal lacquer to put a shiny coat on the top. So let's get started. I'm just going to do a very quick tutorial on painting the box. I'm not going to finish painting the whole box, but just in a, in a box like this, I like to use a sponge brush and load it up with lots of paint. And the sponge brush works great because you can really mash it into the corners when you're painting. It makes it a lot easier than using a bristle brush. Of course, I've picked a color today that's very close to my box, so I'm hoping you can see that it is painting. So give that a nice coat of your paint. And if you notice, I'm working really quickly. You don't have to labor over this part. Work quickly. So paint your entire box inside and out. Make sure you get all of those little corners. And set that aside to dry. Grab some of your favorite rubber stamps that you can stamp onto the surface of your box. I use a cosmetic sponge and black paint when I am stamping on my art boxes. I like to use acrylic paint because if I make a mistake, I can wipe it off. As opposed to ink, when I make a mistake, I have to repaint. So I'm just dabbing this right into the acrylic paint. Make sure that I have an even coat and dab it right on to the top of my stamp. Here's a little designer tip for you. I have found that when I'm using acrylic paint, I put the first coat on and let it set for, oh, 30 seconds to a minute. And it starts to dry. I find that you get a better impression if you season the rubber stamp first. And I do that by applying that first coat. Let it set for 30 seconds or so before you come back and apply your second coat. Now there's still plenty of paint on my cosmetic sponge, so I don't need to go back and add more paint onto the sponge. I just come in and add that second layer of paint onto the rubber stamp. And there you have your design. Now you will notice on my finished example, I like to use lots of different rubber stamp designs on my art boxes. So dig through your rubber stamps and find all sorts of stamps to layer and lay side by side so you can create some really cool effects. Here's a box that shows you just that. I have I think I've used like five or six different stamps, rubber stamp designs on this box. So sides, bottom, inside, 
always put a little surprise inside. You want that little surprise stamp when you open up your art box. Top of the lid, sides, and top. Now you'll notice on this box, it's already really shiny because I make these up in advance and then decide how I want to finish them off. So it's going to work in today's box because I can actually put another coat of gloss over this and I'm going to use my gloss as a glue to adhere my little bee down to the top. So there's not much on here that speaks blooms right now and since that's the theme of today's show, I decided to grab my tulip stencil and these are already sticky so they're reusable, they're self-adhesive and I'm going to just lay it right over the top and press down. This is a really fine detailed stencil so you want to be sure that you have as much of it pressed down onto your surface and because I've used this stencil several times I've noticed the side is not quite as sticky anymore but that's okay we can make it work. Also what you can do on stencils is there is stencil adhesive that you can put on the back so you can continue to reuse these over and over again more. Coming back with my acrylic paint, black acrylic paint, loading up my sponge dabs straight up and down. A lot of times when I watch my students stencil, they tend to use way too much paint and then they tend to try and push the color, which actually pushes it underneath your stencil. So be sure that you just press straight up and down. Right here where it's not sticking, I'm just using my hand to hold it in place. Same thing here, press down, looks like I may have to, oops, check here, I just want that petal to be stenciled all the way along the edge. And I managed to put my finger in over here, so let's go back and stencil. Depending on how opaque that you want this layer, you can do one or two coats. So with just one coat, I'm going to be able to see some of the understamping underneath it. Pull that stencil off. Okay, there's my bloom. Be sure you take this stencil, put it back onto the package or a piece of shrink plastic so that you can preserve the stickiness to the back and wipe off the extra paint. I just use a uh, wet wipe. So you want to set this aside to dry or you can use a heat gun to accelerate it. Just be sure and keep that heat gun farther away because you don't want to overheat the box but this will accelerate the drying time of the acrylic paint. See, that really made that paint dry fast. So grab your hair dryer or your heat gun and you can accelerate that step. As I mentioned, because I'm using the 3D crystal lacquer on this project, I can put a second coat over the coat that was already there. If you were starting from scratch, you wouldn't have to worry about layering your glossy overcoat because you're just putting on one coat but since this is a box that I had already made and had partially ready, I am ending up adding two coats. Hopefully that makes sense. When you're applying your lacquer, you want to draw a line along the edge and then that helps to keep it from floating over the edge. So I draw a line around the edge Well, kind of a straight line. And here's a hint. When it comes to the area where you're painting, 
lift that tip up just a little bit because if you run that tip into the paint you can tend to pull it off especially when you've accelerated the drawing time like I just did and because I've painted over the gloss rather than onto the surface of the just the painted box. So fill this in with your glaze and even though it's a little bit cloudy right now this does dry completely clear. I'm lifting it up over the painted area to fill in Almost there. Okay, if you have any bubbles, you can try and pull them to the side. Now it's really, really important that you set this aside to dry undisturbed and uh, because I tend to, uh, if I set it on my work table, I look over and all of a sudden I have a paper towel stuck to it or something else that I've laid down on my table and I've totally forgotten that I have a wet piece. So set up a spot, a drying spot in your studio so you don't do like I do. Here's my little pin that I'm going to, I've taken the back off. This was, I see one spot here of glue that's a little bumpy that I want to pull off. I've taken the pin back off the back and so I have a really nice flat surface to just set it right into the glaze <laughs> or drop it into the glaze. And let's see, I think I want him to be flying towards my flower. So set him down and he's going to dry right in place. I am going to set this aside and show you how I build the feet for my art box. The first step that you always want to do when you are getting ready to glue any of your slick surfaces is take some alcohol and put it onto a paper towel and wipe off all of your surfaces. You want to be sure to remove any grease or dirt that you might have on the glass pieces. Next I decide how it is that I want to stack them. To create an interesting look, you can certainly stack these straight, or you might want to see if you want them turned. That creates a cool look too. So I take my glass and bead glue and I apply a nice coat onto the bead and I find when I press them together that that squishes it out so that I get broader coverage of the glue. Give them a good press. And on this little art box I am going to put these flat back marbles is the bottom to each of my little feet. So keep building those up until you have all four completed. Okay, I have all of my little legs all completely glued together and I've applied glue to the bottom of the box. So let's Place them down on the bottom and you will find that if you're moving along like I am, 
that these little pieces will shift when you touch them because that glue isn't dry yet. So double check, make sure everything is aligned the way that you want it. And want to make sure you can see it here. So check all of your corners, make sure that they're not hanging over in a way that you don't want them to be. And then once again, you need to let this step set overnight until all of the glue is dry. My Bumblebee and Blooms box is setting aside to dry, so I thought I'd go ahead and show you my Butterfly and Bloom box that's all complete, it's all dry. So I used the same steps to create this box. I painted it and stamped it, stenciled on the top, added my glaze, and put my metal butterfly into the glaze. I added a few rhinestones onto my butterfly, and there's my funky feet glued onto the bottom of the box. There you have it. I love celebrating birds and blooms, or bumblebees and blooms, or butterflies and blooms. I don't know about you, but I think my creative girlfriends are the greatest. I loved their projects today. Just in case you arrived a little bit late to today's show, here's a quick recap. Eco Heidi created a vintage blooms and buttons necklace featuring the vintage Mama Aline technique of bread dough. Candace Jedrowitz worked her creative magic, her amazing creative magic with polymer clay to create a nest full of peepers. Linda Peterson grabbed her collage page and a bird print to create a vintage look decoupaged clay pot. And I stepped into the design studio to create a butterfly in bloom art box and a bee in bloom art box. Just a quick reminder that we do invite you to stop by our Facebook fan page to leave your comment about today's show. We love to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me and my creative girlfriends for today's Cool to Craft. We want to remind you to get creative, get inspired, be cool. Bye.